Well, thank you very much, uh, Karen and all the team here at the center. Uh, it's a real, it's a real pleasure to be here. It's a real pleasure to um, to learn so much, visiting the museum, listening to and enjoying the previous talks. So yes, probably this takes us to a different place, but uh, I think um, you'll enjoy it, and I and I hope uh, you'll enjoy it. Uh, I will share with you this project that Karen was talking about, Structures of Landscape for Tibet Rice Art Center in Montana, which is one of our latest works and one of our first ones uh, in the US. As she was introducing my practice and some of the studio, we are based and we are original from Spain and we moved to, to the US four years ago partly because of this project and also at the same time uh, we were starting a lab in MIT, in the Massachusetts Institute of uh, Technology. So those were very solid reasons to move our gravity center from Spain that we love uh, very much to the US that we also love very much. So just to give you a short introduction, uh, we are not artists per se. We are architects by training and builders of our own work. Our work ranges across scales, across territories, across programs. Uh, we don't like to be fitted into one specific category. Actually, we don't really care about categories very much. We do really care about bringing the best of art and science into architecture and making that available to uh, people. So, that's why some of our works really cross um, the boundaries between sometimes disciplines like uh, architecture, engineering, landscape, art. And these are some examples that I just wanted to, uh, to bring to you from domestic spaces that we use infrastructural uh, precast concrete elements. Um, to uh, restorations of historic buildings that continue memory but create uh, new spaces. Uh, particular to our work is a special look at processes, processes of design and processes of construction. For us, construction um, is uh, how things come together and how architecture or art is built is critical to the way we design it and we think about it especially because we want our ideas to be built. So we like being local, despite in the uh, recent years, we are uh, developing our work in different places, like this is in Mexico City, a structure for a theater, um, now building in Montana and uh, developing projects in other parts. We do like to be very present, so the minute uh, construction um, arrives, we are, uh, uh, we displace part of the team to be uh, there. And I think that you'll understand why when I explain uh, some of the works. So, uh, Kathy and Peter Halstead contacted us four years ago to uh, work in Tippett Rice Art Center to help them think how to uh, build their vision in uh, Montana. Probably they contacted us because they had seen two of the works that I'm gonna show now before showing Tip at Rice so that you are able to understand some of the reasons behind the work and some are of our previous experience. And these are um, two works that we did um, around seven to eight years ago in Spain working with stone in one case with uh, on-site concrete in another case, where we were testing some of the ideas, some of the principles that uh, build our, our company and our work as architects. So before doing this, which is one of the works that we've done in Tippett Rice Art Center, um, one of our early works was done in Santiago de Compostela, which is in Galicia, actually the western part of Spain, and also maybe like uh, Wyoming or Montana, a very, you know, one of the most authentic and wild places of, uh, with amazing landscape. 
here in uh, Santiago, the tradition is to build with stone, and because the building we were going to build here was uh, part of the historic center, we had to build with uh, stone, and this was one of our early commissions. Uh, the building that we were going to develop is the longitudinal building. Um, this one here that is actually occupying the boundary of the property. And uh, this is a very, very beautiful uh, garden that looks at the historic center here. So, and we had to build with stone. Those were, this is um, a building for this general society of authors and editors in Spain. A program that combined some office space with some academic spaces and performance spaces. So our idea was really uh, that the building would almost disappear on the site. Because of the different levels between the garden and the park, we were able to um, uh, do most of the program underground. And then the elements that appeared, you know, so a great part of the program was almost underground. And then the element that appeared was a very monumental stone wall that looked at the garden and provided um, kind of a public space where different events could happen and that was available for all the citizens there. So when we were thinking about stone, we, in our minds, in our education, we had these images, images of uh, sometimes artificial landscapes or um, some of the examples in the history of architecture that we had learned. Um, also some of the Neolithic uh, traditions and architectures that exist in uh, that area of, uh, of Spain. And so when we were looking at the materials that industry offered us to work with, we were not uh, satisfied. We didn't think, um, you know, we wanted to build with such processed uh, elements that were limiting our capacity to create and to imagine. So what we decided to do is actually go to the landscapes, go to the local quarries where the material was extracted from and learn from the origin of the process of transformation so that by acquiring that knowledge, we were able to decide where we wanted to situate ourselves and how we wanted to work with stone. And we were actually captivated by the landscape, also by the amount of material that was spare and that because was not regular, was not fit to enter into the industrial, into industrialized process of cutting very regular slabs. So we talked to the quarry owner and we said, can we use these? What are you gonna do with these? And he said, I'm gonna dispose it, I will crush it and I will use it as gravel. Or... So we said, okay, do you mind if we use it? Can we take it? And he was very happy about the idea. So with, without really knowing still what we wanted to do or telling uh, unveiling our plans, we went back to uh, the office and we started working. Uh, for us, since the beginning, the models are the primary element of design. We is the tool that allow us to think spatially, to think materially, to think structurally at the same time. So actually, we always build the models first and then we sometimes scan it and from there develop the plans or reinterpret them, but it's always the, the kind of object that we venerate, no? that triggers the design and the creative uh, moment. So these were the first studies that we were doing with these huge stones that we actually did not know very well their sizes or we, we still did not know which stones we were going to use. Today we would go with uh, 3D scanners and we would very easily document all the material, but at the time we didn't have these is tools. So we were um, working with some levels of uncertainty. And then we went back to the quarry and very carefully told him what we wanted to do. We showed them the model and of course we had the client on board and uh, and uh, the, the quarry owner was not very happy about it because uh, it was something that they had not done before. Um, it involved some level of risk, manipulating very uh, heavy weights. 
So we convinced him by saying, okay, let's do a mock-up on the quarry, let's test it, we are going to be here, and we actually, uh, uh, I was almost at this point had just graduated from school and I moved four months to the quarry and lived there for four months to really get them, uh, uh, to let them know that we were in the team and that we were going to build that with them. So we started putting one st a stone on top of another and then another one and, uh, and really learning from them at the same time that we were challenging some of their typical methods of work, so it was really a team uh, work, we can say. As you can imagine, working with this level of noise and dust, you know, was uh, a tough moment, but nevertheless very, very enriching uh, and very empowering. And uh, this was the stone wall completed. Uh, in the end, we realized it made much more sense to build it here. The quarry is like one hour and a half away from the actual site, so moving all this material without the certainty that we were using those exact stones and where they were placed didn't seem um, reasonable. So we built it here. Here it's, almost, it's a sculpture. It's just in the landscape. It was actually very beautiful because it was as if matter had reorganized itself in, in this kind of organized or choreographed way. And uh, at some point, I think he was joking, but the quarry owner said, okay, I'm gonna keep this one in my quarry and let's make another one, no? At which point, <laughs> I just couldn't. <laughs> but then, of course, we dismantled it and we moved it to the site. This photograph it represents a critical moment in my life because I think I've never learned more than really spending four months in the quarry about how to really get something built. And I think this applies for everything in life, like especially when you're an architect, uh, you are not alone. You have to talk with a lot of people. We have, you have to get a lot of people involved, in love, convinced, and really working and exchanging. So the first days were really critical with a lot of fights and disagreements, but this was the last day, so the ending was really um, happy. And then we moved um, we moved stone by stone now to the site in this historic center that allowed very little improvisation, so we had, in a way, rehearsed the whole process, and then now we were completely ready to, to build it on the site in its uh, final position, having resolved all the uh, conflict moments in the process. So this is the final uh, work on the site. that in a way for us brings the scale of the landscape and the scale of the quarry into the site and, uh, and creates a, um, a wall that refers to probably moments in history but also to uh, the reality of those landscapes that belong to uh, the side and that are structures that allow for interaction, allow for interpretation, and um, and uh, allow for some excitement. So, the second work that uh, I want to present to you that um, um, was part of the learning process that took us to uh, the works in Tippet Rice is the truffle. This is also in Galicia in the in the um, northwestern part of Spain, in, a, in an amazing cliff where no architecture was allowed to be built. If you wanted to build something uh, in, a, in a property that we had uh, here, it had to be either a shed for an animal or for tools. Um, and we wanted to make an experiment of an architecture that would be born from the site after our experience in Santiago that would actually blend completely, but that is still held a, a space to be inhabited. 
So the program was very simple um, for one or two uh, people to sleep and to enjoy the, the, um, the view of the ocean. And uh, the same way that um, we did a bit in Santiago, we designed the process of how we were going to build it almost as a recipe. So the first step was to um, also with the idea to minimize the use of resources and build with whatever was available on the site, we were going to carve a hole on the ground. Then we were going to create the space with hay bales to fill, to serve as formwork. We would fill the space in between with concrete. That would be the structure. We would remove the earth and then we would cut the two openings, the door and the window. And this would be the architecture that we would be able to build just by ourselves. And then we were imagining the, the local cows eating the formwork. <laughs> but then we didn't dare to do this because, I don't know. <laughs> So this shows very quickly the, this process that I was talking about, the hay bales that are the space, how we build the formwork with the hay bales and the earth. So this is the window, and now the door is going to appear here. And the resulting architecture, which is this one, actually blends with the um, the land that is around, of course, it has concrete that gives it resistance, but concrete in itself is a mineral and it, it aggregates very well with stones and with earth. So over the, the, the time also, uh, grass has grown on top of it and uh, inside, um, the concrete takes a different materiality, um, almost like the materiality for the contact with uh, the hay bales, and also this kind of abstraction of uh, its liquid condition with the ocean and with the sky. So this for us is kind of a poem of architecture and nature. And, um, and these two works are probably works that uh, Kathy and Peter saw. So when they um, they contacted us. They had this dream of building an art center for many years since they had visited Storm King in New York. And uh, they are both artists, great artists. They are lovers of nature and they love Montana as well. And for, these, the, for them, this was kind of a dream project that they were very careful and are, still are in all the steps that they um, take. Uh, I believe there was a competition uh, to build the architecture uh, center and uh, in their uh, ranch. I think this is the combination of four different ranches, about 11,500 acres of grazing land um, in a beautiful site in Fishtail, um, very close to Yellowstone Park, so I'm sure many of you are aware of the landscape. It's a very similar landscape, of course, that we see here. So I was almost in tears as I uh, landed in, in Cody and saw like the mountains again and the sky. Um, but they, they did a competition to think about the art center. What would it be? How the architecture could contribute? 
Uh, it seems that they called us or they sent us an invitation. We didn't answer, so we didn't participate in it. But um, they were not convinced about their results, so we were lucky to have a second chance after. They called us back and they said, uh, hello, we want to do this project. We would like to share some ideas with you so you will be competing on your own. And so we were, um, we were very excited. Their idea was the program that they wanted to create is a, uh, an art center where outdoor sculpture and music play a major role. And uh, um, again, for, for many of you, this landscape is uh, very familiar, but we were completely drawn by the vastness, by the silence, by the wilderness. And uh, the first thing we did when we received their call was go to visit and go to uh, really get immersed in the experience of, of the landscape uh, in order to forget our urban thinking. I don't our reaction to this project was that we couldn't really design with the tools that we brought from our uh, office. We almost had to uh, develop new ones from the experience of the site, and that's what we did. We came, uh, we went to Montana uh, many times. We had a lot of conversations with uh, Kathy and Peter to figure out what made sense. And uh, what ended up making sense was instead of be making a big building and concentrated all the program in one space, because this is such a beautiful and extensive site, was really to articulate the architecture in a way that would invite visitors to experience the land and that would also provide some shelter, because um, this, is, uh, um, this is a land that you know, preserves its wilderness, preserves its ranching activity, and um, and uh, for the most part of it, there are no trees and uh, no options for shade. So really basic uh, sheltering principles were things that the architecture needed to uh, provide. So in the office with you know, all our learning from the site, we started to experiment and also some of the lessons learned from the works that I shared with you and other works, we started to experiment and to uh, imagine how could architecture, how could a space be born from the logics of the site, from the canyons, from the readings of the hills, of the mountains, and how could we interpret geological processes of erosion, sedimentation, crystallization, to um, create a new language for this site and also a catalog of possibilities uh, that would help the client start the, um, the center, but also would help them evolve in time. So believe it or not, each of these um, architectures or sculptures, or however uh, each of you want to interpret it, um, they refer to a place in the landscape uh, and they refer to different processes of uh, formation. And we very strategically scattered them um, on the land so that they would be easily accessed, but that they would also help discover uh, places for the visitors, that they would also um, have their own intimate connection and relation to the site so that no matter where you are, you always feel the strong uh, connection with the landscape. And for the most part, they are outdoor rooms that require very little maintenance that are perfectly okay with the cattle getting near or wildlife getting close, that uh, they uh, they resist all the extreme weather conditions that happen there, so that was part of the uh, logic. And that they would also, in a way, dance with the other art pieces that um, are now on the site and that will be progressively maybe evolving. So I will, because this is, uh, uh, we are in the context of art and sculpture, I thought you might 
want to see, would be interesting to share some of the sculptures that are already in the park. Uh, this is um, a calder, Alexander Calder called Two Discs, that um, I think was lended, uh, was, is a loan from the Hitchhorn Museum in Washington. This is um, a site-specific work um, called Daydreams by Patrick Doherty, which is very beautiful, and it represents uh, an old schoolhouse. Um, Pioneer uh, by Stephen Talasnik, all contemporary artists. Um, this is Beethoven's quartet from uh, Mark de Suverell. Uh, and this piece comes from Storm King Museum of Art and was acquired by uh, Tippett Rice. And then Proverb also by Mark de Suvero, which uh, used to be in uh, the Arts District in Texas, in Dallas, Texas. So these are all um, on the side already, and as you can see, each of them seem to be completely isolated in their own uh, space. It's uh, in some strategic moments, you're able to see two sculptures at the same time, but they, each of them fit very specially in their own place. So in a way for us, they describe this kind of constellation of elements that whereas before it was very difficult to orient yourself on the, on the site, now with the introduction of these elements, you're able to go from one and to another and, uh, and experience uh, nature with art and with the different performances that happen on the different sites um, in a different way. So I will explain, start explaining with you some of the first early um, structures that we developed, and I will end up with the three ones that we actually built so that I am able also to explain some of the processes of uh, construction. Uh, this is uh, academia. Academia was uh, meant to be uh, a, pl a place, as the word invites to, um, um, to understand, a place for conversation, a place to bring together artists in residence, artists with visitors. It is located in a place that is close to uh, the entrance, so it's easy to access. And it's a place also where fire can be, um, can take place and, uh, or barbecues, but also it's a place that um, in a way is created as an explosion itself. So really thinking about how, um, how energy can be used to build space out of mass. So, the process for creating these, uh, these works, as I was explaining before, is really from the model, from experimenting with our hands and, um, and working uh, with the model. And once the model is developed, we scan it, we transform it into drawings, we start introducing a scale and thinking structurally about how it's going to be built, we test how uh, it will fit in the landscape. In this case, it's, a, it's a, a structure that is almost completing the hill and breaking it, open it up, so you are almost kind of inhabiting that uh, hill. And here I'm showing uh, part of the process of, of uh, designing and, and building these models in our office. So here, for example, we are applying some of the things that we learned in the quarry and how actually stone is extracted by using explosives. And I know this is not uh, very much used in architecture, but we believe it has potential. <laughs> you can understand why this is not the first one we've built, but it's there. So who knows? So I don't really know if this looks contemporary or completely archaic in a way, <laughs> maybe both. Um, the second 
uh, one that I'm going to uh, show you so that you get an idea of the scope and the, the kind of range of possibilities that we were depicting is Fontana. It's a fountain itself located in one of the water ponds that um, exist on the site. There are not too many, so uh, these ponds is where cattle drink, but we thought that if visitors are going to um, to arrive, we could contribute creating a structure that filters the water, that maybe captures it, and where they can actually refresh themselves and drink from and fill up their bottles. Um, I won't explain the processes because they are all uh, repetitive in the methodology, but We are building the concrete, the, the form, but then we are applying weight on it to displace uh, the matter. And then we work with water and how, and ima try to imagine how water would be filled um, and how could we actually develop an architecture that is in a way dynamic, that can um, move slightly with the balance of water and actually interact with maybe snow and water as it um, falls in it. So this is in a very conceptual stage. You can imagine how many steps after happen until you know one of these um, ideas get to be realized. So all these examples are in a very uh, early stage. This is a larger scale uh, structure that can accommodate um, uh, larger events. Ponte is an infrastructural element that connects, uh, that bridges a canyon and connects to uh, disconnected places of the land that actually would benefit from this uh, pedestrian option. And it's built by casting it on the ground, and then that form becomes actually the path to walk from the top to the bottom of the canyon. We also like very much the model because it's a collect if allo it allows the moment of creativity to be a collective act and we can participate in it, the different members of the office in, in many ways. So this is an another way in which we were envisioning these structures in the landscape. Midnight Rostra is a cantilever uh, over a canyon. Uh, tabula acustica is a larger um, structure that would be able to host uh, um, bigger concerts and that would be specifically designed uh, for the acoustics. You know, very much learning from um, um, other classic examples like the Greek theaters and the Greek temples. And uh, a tabula represents or inverts the space of the mountains. Um, it has this slab that is actually casted on the ground. So you can see how already in the early design process how it's going to be built becomes critical. So here we are crushing the rock on the site. 
we are casting this large element on the ground because it's much more, it's much easier to do. These would be engineered acoustically to reflect the sound and then it is lifted using the cores with hydraulic pistons. And here is a, um, a model where we are performing. Well, we need a lot of, yeah, in, in, the, in, the, in reality it would be done with hydraulic pistons, but a lot of them, so. And also we, we would need to find a way, of course, to make this slab lighter inside, but we're not there yet. Anyways, this would be the kind of inversion of the mountains that um, we were picturing. So after showing an overwhelming Kathy and Peter with all of these, they decided to uh, start building two portals, we call them, which are actually kind of symbolic uh, windows or doors into the landscape, and they are positioned in two of the access roads of the center. And then Domo, which is a larger structure uh, that is able to accommodate small performances. So Beartooth Portal, it's uh, located in the one of the expansions of the canyon. And again, using the same uh, process of working with the model and transferring that into uh, two-dimensional uh, drawings to be able to engineer and uh, work with other consultants to do uh, the calculations of the reinforcements, etc. But these are some of the drawings that I like most where there are drawings that are actually scripting how the construction is going to happen. Again, trying to minimize their resources, trying to use the land as the formwork um, uh, or the support for these structures to be poured and casted and, and hardened. And then when they are hard enough and they've uh, acquired their structural um, resistance, they are tilted into their final position. So in this moment is where we were engaging then uh, local engineers and the local contractors to really be able to uh, be able to uh, you know accommodate all of their comments and transform these ideas into um, uh, projects that could be realized within the the logics of the of the site and of their resources available. So this is the, the Murphy Canyon. And uh, the portal is actually um, moves away from the road, is very easily accessed, but it still wants to enjoy, try to attract visitors to that spot where actually the canyon can be seen. We decided to, instead of carving in the real, in the actual ground, to build up with land, because what we learned from the local rancher is that if we were carving the actual ground, it would be very difficult to recover it afterwards. So in this way, we we would, after tilting the pieces, we would remove the sand, and and then the the grass would very easily uh, grow again on the site. So we were doing the forms. We were present in all of these uh, moments to people from uh, the office actually moved to, to live in, in Montana. And uh, me and my partner, we were uh, traveling back and forth uh, from Boston uh, very often. And uh, of course the construction process was delayed because here we, I just learned that the weather rules. <laughs> And on, although there are very good skills pouring concrete in uh, really difficult weather conditions, but uh, still there were many days that we just couldn't work. But you can see here, now with all the local labor, how the processes are adapted. 
and how the script allowed the what we had designed about the process really allowed enough flexibility for um, for the local input to enrich it and make it happen. So this is the moment when, after um, about 10 days of curing of the concrete, we were able to tilt it to their final position. You can see the scale of the cranes, which are enormous. But of course, for this site, which is quite exposed to winds, the weight of the of these elements uh, was very important for us. So the weight of the concrete was really playing on our side. The materials that we are using, as uh, I showed in the previous project, is really mixing concrete, using concrete as binder for other local materials, from earth, rock, so that's why um, it ends up blending. Um, the rough surfaces, uh, that hold the earth allow for a nature to grow and the, in them and they in a way represent this rough uh, space of the canyon and then the shiny part which is uh, where we when we were using plastics helps to capture the light and to reflect the colors so it has a different way of blending with that landscape and they serve these smaller pieces they serve mostly as shelters as as, place, our pla as places to enjoy specific views or to have a small picnic or for interpreters to uh, practice. They're really open to, um, to the use that the visitor wants to give them. And they also operate as sculptures uh, against the, the landscape. Inverted portal is, um, is similar in scale, is uh, located, as I was saying, in this is one of the roads that accesses from the entrance to the rest, to the performance spaces, and this is the other road that accesses most of the sculpture areas. So the place where this uh, work is located is actually building this symbolic uh, door, and we call it inverted because it follows a very similar process, it just uh, in tilts up in an inverted way from the Virtus portal that we have uh, previously seen. But you have, you know, the process, you know, where we were doing the all the form work, um, we were casting it and doing all the reinforcement, and then we were covering it with earth so that it would mix with the concrete and would allow for um, these more organic uh, texture. So here the rough part is in the outside so that eventually um, the grass would be able to grow in it or evolve however nature wants to make use of it. And then you can see from these viewpoint, you can actually see virtual portal and inverted portal, uh, giving a sense of orientation on the site. There are moments where you can understand where the references um, come from and how they relate in different ways to uh, the landscapes where they are inserted. And Domo is the space of the hills I was showing Tabula Acoustica before, the larger um, theater that referred to the mountains. Domo refers to the hills, and it's actually located in a valley between uh, some hills. It's um, about 5,000 square meters, meters in total, so it's able to accommodate small performances or events. Now I think they're planning to do some theater plays. And uh, in this case, um, the top part is thought to be almost like an extension of um, the land around it. And the bottom part is this representation of the hills that is actually going to serve as an acoustic uh, shell. 
So we needed the top part to be rough and earthy and the bottom part to be uh, shiny and reflect the sound. So we went through all the uh, engineering. And for this one, we actually went uh, back. This is, the, this is again Galicia in Spain. So in the summer before coming to uh, uh, Montana to build, we decided to make larger scale model where we could actually rehearse the process of construction that we, we would then uh, talk and evolve with the local people, but we wanted to get this expertise ourselves at a larger scale. So here uh, we are training ourselves in this process. So then we go to the site. In this case, because it's a larger structure, it doesn't make sense to tilt or move with cranes. Um, so we decided to actually build the whole uh, void, the space with the earth, cast the form in concrete, and then we would remove uh, the earth from underneath and reveal the, the space. So here, all the machines are preparing actually that form where in the in the second work that I showed today the the hay bales where this is space that now the the soil is actually building So this is kind of the negative of the actual work, which is um, it's a, a technique that it's very usual in a sculpture. And then we were using these, um, the holes to create all the reinforcement. And as you can see, I mean, here the value is not in the final f edge or the final detail or the exact uh, texture. It's more about the scale, it's about the materiality, it's about um, you know, the kind of performance that can deliver uh, different results. So the plastics here are really going to make the concrete not rough, but shiny, which is what we want to bounce uh, the sound and create a more reflective space. For this one, we were actually, the concrete plant was on the side, so we were doing the concrete on the side. And then the moment of the final moments is almost kind of an archeological moment. It's a moment of discovery. We have this space hidden and we are unearthing it and bringing it to, to life. These are the So we call them structures of landscape because they are born from the landscape. They refer to the landscape, they are casted in it, they are extracted and unearthed from it. They have an ambiguous condition probably between art, architecture, landscape or nature. They can be one thing or another or all of them at the same time. But they do mediate between the vast scale of the landscape and the scale of the human being to create a shelter, to create a moment of intimacy, to create a, a feeling of protection while being completely exposed to the land. Um, they certainly belong to nature. Nature will transform them and will appropriate it. And we are looking forward to these. They reflect the colors of the sky. 
they continue the textures of the ground. Um, but they, they also have a very artistic expression. They operate as the sculptures and uh, they are perfectly okay if they're not, if they're empty, which was some of an aspect that we wanted to achieve. There's nothing worse than an empty building. And, uh, and so they had to operate and be able to operate in these conditions. And they have many architectural features, you know, they, in the way that sound moves through them and they actually become instruments that project the sound into the landscape in very specific uh, ways. And also their mass, the thermal mass, is able to uh, negotiate or calibrate the exterior temperatures. So in the summer, if you shelter yourself under the structure of Domo, the temperature drops considerably. And uh, they're certainly open uh, enough uh, to be reinterpreted, to be used, to be completed by the performers and uh, the users. And I really invite you to look online to tip a rise and try to go to some of the concerts that happen in the summer in Domo because they have an extraordinary music program on top of the beauty of the art and uh, of the land, of course. Thank you very much. <laughs>